Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're doing something a little bit different today because in addition to today's special guest, Eric Alexander, we just listened to an incredible version of Embraceable You from Eric uh, with Harold Mayburn, John Weber, and Joe Farnsworth. We'll talk about Harold in a second. Uh, we've got uh, another tenor player and a good friend of Eric's and a friend of mine joining us, Jed Paradis. So, <coughs> <coughs> hell boy. So, hello, Eric. Let's start with you. How are you, my friend? Well, I'm feeling good in Do general. That brought back, that's very bittersweet for me to see that because uh, I don't spend a lot of time looking at things that I may or may not have done. And of course, when I mean that I have done that I may or may not like. And of course, the first thing that happens is I start criticizing myself. So I had to walk away from the video. But then on top of that, you know, it's very bittersweet for me because I that will never be replaced. That will never exist for me except in my memories, you know, to play with with Harold uh, and, you know, just hearing the things he's doing. It's as if he's standing right next to me. I know what he's going to do before he does it. And he knows what I'm going to do before I do it. And um, it's just amazing. I spent so much time with that man and I learned you know, the vast majority of what I know from him. Uh, and some of that was indirectly coming uh, from George Coleman, but the conveyor, the person who delivered it to me, by and large, was Harold. And I met him. He was 51 years old when I met him. I didn't know who he was. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's wow. pathetic. I, I And I was, uh, how old was I? Uh, 19. And... But maybe he was 50. I want to calibrate this correctly. I believe he was the, I was the same age that he was uh, when he died. It's just it's just amazing. And then I and then so I meet a person that I don't know, but I know him very well after about five minutes, by the way. And I knew that he was uh, a person of, of great. Well, how can I put it? of great interest to me. I knew that he was the real deal. You know, I just latched onto him like a barnacle. And uh, it went from, uh, was, you know, a student and master kind of mentor, uh, or father figure, well, actually sort of tyrant, terrifying musical giant lording over me. Then it went to um, musical associate because we started working together you know when i was 25 years old or so he did not make it easy on me to start interacting in that way he was very cautious and he was very uh formal and he he demanded things you know when i asked him to record from that album straight up which was the first thing i recorded as a leader he really made it hard on me to get him lined up to do it and he wanted to know the this, that, the other thing, how are we getting paid? Who's in charge of the publishing? And he was concerned with, he, he's always been concerned with those details, but he was pouring it on to try to man me up and make sure I knew that I was not at his level. I had no, I wasn't harboring any illusions that I was at his level. And in fact, he, he crafted that entire first album himself. I think all of the arrangements and tune concepts with maybe one exception were delivered by him. And truthfully, that's the way a lot of our musical interaction went for years and years and years. He just put me on his shoulders and carried me around uh, and sort of tolerated me, but thought that I had potential. And it's just amazing to think that we went from that to he was really my best friend. And uh, he was the person I used to tell my ex-wife, I almost felt guilty. I spent more time with him than I did even with her. I was with him almost every day of my life. And uh, I mean, the level that we that we got to, it's kind of indescribable. I don't really know. It's almost making me uh, get teary. Don't know what to say. OK, well, we'll put you on. We'll put you on hold for a second. here. I'm OK. I'm just going to stop talking about it. OK, uh, I've I've, uh, you know, in, in those it, trying to explain it, what happens is I listen to myself trying to explain how I feel about him and then I get emotional and uh, it's interesting when he died i refused to be emotional about it and i talked with george coleman and joe farnsworth we were the first three people i think that knew and it was under wraps for a while um for a variety of reasons 
George and I were both absolutely numb. We just didn't, and George said often that it's going to come back and bite us. But for now, it, we're, it won't. Because you just, when a person that's that strong is, it disappears, it, it's unfathomable. And you can still feel him, like I can feel him on my shoulder. And, uh, so when I, I eventually had to speak at his memorial, and it was unannounced. Nobody told me I was going to have to speak. And I had promised myself that I would never tear up because Harold would not like that. Not because he wasn't sensitive, he was very sensitive, but he was uh, a rock for everyone else. When his wife died, he was the only one not broken down. And I watched that and I knew that he wouldn't want me tearing up. And my son Lucas knew that as well. So they said, Eric, why don't you say the final words here at South Orange Performing Arts Center? And so I impromptu started speaking. And at the very end, I signed off because I could feel myself quavering, but I didn't do it. <laughs> and I, and uh, after the, the thing, my son Lucas said, Dad, you almost started crying and you said you wouldn't. You almost blew it. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. I mean, it's not a lack of sensitivity. It's he would what Harold would say is dry up those alligator, those crocodile tears and keep stepping. And if you think that I gave you something, you better be giving it to other people because that's the way it goes. Absolutely. Now, Jed, how did you first find out about Eric? And uh, tell us what uh, Harold Mayburn said about Eric. Uh, yeah, I, I read uh, when I was at uh, Smoke, I heard Eric live. My friend Bob Belden, uh, who lived uh, right up the street uh, from over, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, here Eric Alexander, he's, he's the real deal, he's, he told me. And, uh, you know, so I went out and I, I heard Eric knocked out. And I'd heard him uh, well, in his earlys, and uh, and uh, but you know after seeing him live, I uh, became such a, a, a fan of his. You know, he's basically everything to hear as a, uh, as a fellow tenor saxophone, fellow jazz musician, um, and uh, so I, I used to come to New York a lot and. Uh, invited uh, Eric to come down, I was living in Mexico at the time, and uh, invited uh, Eric to come down to the play at the San Miguel de Inde Jazz Fest. So he brought down with uh, Peter Bernstein and, and uh, John Weber and Farnsworth. And, you know, and, uh, and I love hanging out with Eric and uh, as much as I love listening to him. And, uh, you know, just, just as, you know, to, to hear that cut with Harold Mayburn is, is amazing, uh, you know, just how Harold and Eric interact together musically and, uh, and he provides such an incredible, you know, orchestra almost of sound, you know, sonic sound behind Eric's, uh, you know, when, when they're, when they're playing. So it's, you know, I can see like the connection is so and uh, I was telling Brett the other day when I was talking to Harold, I, you know, and I was just saying how, you know, much I enjoyed them, you know, hearing them play together. He told me, you know, straight out that he thought, you know, Eric was, um, and Eric will be embarrassed and deny this, you know, but he, he'll say, he said that Eric, you know, was the most important, you know, sax player, you know, uh, and he compared him you know, in the same breath to Coltrane. Uh, you know, I thought that was like, you know, coming from, you know, and that was no bullshit. That's I'm sure exactly the way Harold. Felt. Yeah. Now, Eric, you started out on uh, 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 piano and then clarinet and alto sax. How'd you end up on the tenor and why did you decide to play jazz? I'm going to keep this answer shorter. I have no fucking idea. Uh, pardon my French. You know, I was pretty good at classical piano. They wanted to ship me off to study with some real hard-nosed teachers, maybe some Eastern European or Russian piano teachers. But I got to the point where, because I didn't understand the harmonic movement of the music, I was unable to start making a mistake and to restart, I mean, to fix it, because I didn't know where I was. I would have to go backtrack. And it happened a couple times, that was it for me. It was too humiliating. I'd always been the little darling and everyone did a champagne toast after I played and then I started screwing up, so I just quit. 
and I had been playing clarinet and that was absolutely a disaster. They demoted me to bass clarinet and then contrabass clarinet, believe it or not. I used to share a mouthpiece with a girl named Lisa Beaver and I brought my back teen de uh, uh, sanitary spray and I would clean the mouthpiece before a band. I called a teacher in town and, and said, Mr. Duxbury, can I have bass clarinet lessons? And he said, you most certainly cannot, but I will give you saxophone lessons. So that was the beginning of the saxophone. I had some friends in the sax section. We had a friendly competition. I must have had some musical talent. He was a great teacher, by the way. He was like a military grade. He was like the drill sergeant in full metal jacket. I mean, I'm serious. He had my ass. I was terrified and he taught me technique. And uh, so I went away to college and I knew that I was kind of good at music. So I wasn't going to stop doing it, but I was getting a political science degree. Uh, and a minor in music at Indiana University. And then I caught the disease. You know, I just started figuring out how to play blues enough, wow. listening, to Bird, listening to Bird. And I just said, that's it. I'm going to play jazz. And I told my father I would drop out of college and move to New York. And he said, the hell you will, kid. You'll be selling your ass within a week. And so I had to find a place to continue my college study. That's an exact quote. That's an exact quote. And so, uh, and by the way, he became great, great friends. And my mother as well. Both of them have passed on with Harold. They got along so well, it was beautiful. But so I went to William Patterson College, not knowing anything, just knowing it was near New York and the rest is history. That's how I ended up in this. If I, if I humbly, with incredible humility, give myself a tiny bit of credit, it's simply that I recognized that this was serious. Because I, I, I had proclaimed to myself and to the world that I wanted to play jazz, and then I ran into Harold Mayburn on the first day of my sophomore year in college, and that was it. That was the end. Well, Harold is a remarkable man on many levels, that's for sure. Uh, Eric, when you, start, when you first got into jazz, who were the tenor players that you admired, that you listened to? Well, this is a, <laughs> this is a funny uh, question. Now, I, I didn't have access to the music that would ultimately become what, what launched me into my formative training. When I was in high school, you know, if I went to the local record store that had any jazz whatsoever, it was called Rainy Day Records. And the most jazzy thing I could find would be maybe a David Sanborn record, which I liked, but I, I didn't, they didn't have any blue note or prestige, nothing. I had a teacher by the name of Cheryl Edensward. Uh, she was a very good saxophone teacher. And she taught me a little bit of jazz and she would loan me things like Dexter Gordon Homecoming or Stan. I remember this one seriously. She loaned me Stanley Turrentine, Let It Go. That's one of the first things I heard that was real jazz. And she also loaned me Giant Steps. And so I had very little but positive uh, incoming influence, in, you know, in, in, at least in terms of, of into my ear. I, I didn't know what to play. I didn't know how to solo. I didn't know anything. I didn't know any tunes. But when I uh, went to college, I'll tell you what really got me at the, same, at the same time when I met Harold Mayburn. The only tenor players I knew, and it was by accident, were George Coleman, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Stanley Turrentine, and that's about it. I'd never heard of Sonny Stitt, never heard of... Oh, I had, funnily enough, I had, I had listened to Gene Ammons in high school. I made spaghetti bolognese for my first girlfriend. Her name was Wendy Weeps. She was blonde. And uh, my father said, kid, that's a real hot number. You better put on some candlelight and some Gene Ammons. So I brought her over and tried to be romantic. But I was listening to Gentle Jug. <laughs> I mean, it's just all so hap you know, haphazard, really, when I look back on it. Um, but I, at William Patterson College, I discovered Sonny Stitt at the DJ Lounge. Now, I don't know if you've heard that, Brett or Jed. Have you heard that? I don't know that one. No. It you can find it on YouTube. There's another tenor player who's listed. I don't know if it's even accurate. John Board, B-O-A-R-D. And then you have Edmund Buster on the organ. And I don't recall who the drummer is. And the, this is what got me. They, well, the first thing they play is a blues and B flat. And of course, well, we don't even need to talk about what Stitt did on that. And then they play, uh, it all depends on you. And Stitt picks up the alto. Boo ba da ba it all depends on you. Who would it even? And he starts embellishing, and that's it. He finishes the melody. I think he plays, he lets the other guy play a chorus. 
he takes the melody out and then starts tagging. And he tags for like 15 minutes. And the tag is better than any tune you could forget it. I mean, I remember Art Taylor, I was rehearsing with him before he passed from pancreatic cancer. And he said, young man, well, the first, the first thing he said was, you don't play loud enough. It really frustrated me because everyone else said, you're too loud. I was trying to, uh, I'm off track here, Brett, sorry. I'm, I'm digressing, but too bad for you. Uh, Art said, you don't play loud enough. And I said, but everyone else says me says that I play too loud. And he says, well, there are pussies. You got to play louder. If I'm behind you, I want to feel you in my bones when you're blowing away from me. And I said, but it hurts. Yeah, yeah you got to play louder. He wanted me to be like Gene Ammons. And the next thing he said was, when we do our gig, I want you to walk out of the bathroom playing a tag. He said, but do you even know how to play a tag? He was just abusing me. And I said, well, yeah, you know, and I, he said, all right, let's play, but not for me and go into a tag. So I got him into the tag, uh, but he didn't like the way I was trying to end the tag because I think I did something like, I was trying to give like a sunny state cue and he said it was just pathetic and he was pissed off and slammed his sticks down. He said I had to work on it. Anyway, the, uh, that, yeah, that Sunny Sit tag, that changed my life. And then I got the album with Bud Powell, Max Roach, and Sonny Stitz. I think sometimes it's called Bud's Blues. He plays uh, Strike of the Band, uh, I Want to Be Happy, Fine and Dandy. Apparently, Sonny Stitt was abusive with Bud Powell on that. He said, the great Bud Powell, I'm going to slaughter your ass. And he had, they were both just completely revved up. And Sonny Stitt plays, they should be in the Smithsonian. Those solos are faultless. There is not one error and not one known out of place that and that just completely changed my life that was it yeah you know i was very lucky to see sonny stitt uh shortly before he passed uh in fact it was the day monk died because it was down at fat tuesdays and they sent a crew a crew it's 1982 right yeah they sent a crew down there to interview art blakey but i sat like right in front of sonny stitt and he put on a demonstration. He played tenor. He played alto. He played some. Fl it was just unbelievable. I've, I've never heard that kind of mastery. It was just incredible. Jed, I wanted to ask you, how did you get into this whole thing? You're originally from Florida. How did you get into the tenor and why did you get into jazz? Uh, just, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I played uh, a little piano as a kid. Oh, wait, and, uh, sorry, I was I a. I have to interrupt Jed. I have to interrupt Jed. Sorry, Jed. Really bad because I didn't even answer Brett's question at all. And then I'm going to just finish okay. his question. You, that you played yeah. clarinet. How did you play jazz? Well, the guy told me he would give me saxophone lessons. And then I switched to tenor because I didn't know any tunes anyway and it felt better. There. That's the end. Okay, Jed. <laughs> No, just, uh, you know, I, I always, uh, I was such a jazz fan in high school and I used to go listen to Ira Sullivan, you know, every week uh, at the Unitarian Church in Miami. And, uh, and it was, and Ira Sullivan, you know, was just, uh, you know, insane uh, 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 trumpet player, flugelhorn player, tenor, alto, soprano, flute, alto, flute. And, and he was, he was just, he would play, you know, from everything from, you know, the most uh, traditional jazz, just, you know, to playing really avant-garde. And I used to, and I used to go over there and, uh, and watch him. And then when I uh, got to college, uh, I, I said, well, I'm going to be a tenor player in my next life. And my friend said, why don't you pick up the saxophone now? And, uh, and so I did and got a, a teacher and, uh, you know, started, started playing and uh, studying with the a friend of mine, Steve Solomon, at the junior college, and and just you know just always had a love affair with jazz and the saxophone. Even though I'm you know just a, uh, a neophyte, you know beginner compared to somebody like Eric, you know. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, well, that and I, that's not I, I true. That's not true, man. You can play. I mean, come on, don't don't I, I, your talent. I would like to say something, but you know. <laughs> As Golda Meir once said, don't be so humble. You're not that good. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I did get to ha hang out. You know, one of, one of the greatest things about being a tenor player is realizing who, who the greats are, you know, and, and, 
And, uh, you know, I, I, when Sunny Stitt was in Tucson, uh, where I moved to and went to college, uh, I, I kind of followed him and, and he was there at the Doubletree for a week and played every night. And I would go over during the day and hang out with uh, Sonny Stitt, you know, and we just, you know, he, we, he'd be watching like, uh, um, you know, that Keith Carradine uh, Kung Fu. And he'd go, yeah, that's serious shit, man. And he would tell me stories about Bird and, you know, and I would just like, just be like so uh, appreciative that he, that he took the time to hang out and, you know, and tell me stories. Yeah, he was, uh, I mean, all those guys, all those older guys, they came from a different world completely. And they, their stories, you know, musically and stories about life were just incredible. She said, I want you guys are like two tenor players. You know, one of the things about the tenor saxophone and also any great jazz musician is that you can usually tell after a couple notes or a phrase who it is by the musician, their sound, their approach. Uh, in terms of you guys, how do you develop your own sound? What how do, what goes into that? Well, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, you know, I was going to say, unfortunately, that's that's not necessarily the case anymore. There's a lot of uh, of uh, uh, there's a, there's a distinct lack of indiv individual starting tone now. I'm not sure why. Um, well, I have my theories. Part of it's based on equipment. And part of it is herd mentality now. It's the same thing as when you're driving on the highway. You know, it doesn't need to be crowded, but there's this target fixation. Everyone bunches up and drives bumper to bumper when you could just change a lane and have all the space in the world. People like this mob mentality. So a, a concept becomes, you know, the, the concept of the year, a certain approach or a certain player. And rather than just allowing the the excellence of another player to exist without barnacling to it. Everyone barnacles to it. It's just a mob. They feel better. It's very hard to, to distinguish. I really have to listen carefully and I'm a good listener and I know a lot of players now, but uh, there's a lot of sameness and I think you guys will agree. And I'm not criticizing anyone because people will, will criticize me. So I'm, I'm uh, forgiving and merciful with them. They will say about me, all he sounds like is George Coleman. He just sounds like George Coleman, and that's that. That will be the dismissive hand wave. Well, uh, you know, my dismissive hand wave would be: I don't know who you are at all. I have no idea who this person is unless I really listen to two or three cuts. What you said, Brett, a phrase or a tone. Who is that? A phrase, one phrase, or just a couple bars and hearing the tone. It's very rare now with players. Shit, what is it? Under the age of sixty players under the age of 60 to, to know who it is in a measure of sound. How do you get your own sound? You don't try to. That's rule number one. How do you get your own style? You don't try to. You just play music uh, and you play in a way that that suits you and your physiology. Nobody is going to sound like anyone else if they make the horn work for them in the way that it works for them best. The way that it works for George Garzon is not the way that it works for me, and that's not the way it works for Jed, not the way it works for George Coleman. You get equipment that allows you to move. Like George, George says, everything falls into place. You get your technique together, you get your articulation together, you learn how to play at a volume that gives you the most flexibility and the most authority. Then you play harmony, you don't play licks. Licks are for cows, you gotta understand harmony, and you have to be so immersed in the language that a lot of stuff comes out of you in the blink of an eye subconscious but some stuff comes out of you because you're thoughtful after all and you have harmonic concepts and and when you do that you will sound like yourself if you just try to insert joe henderson licks on tunes that joe henderson played with joe henderson sound you will not have your own sound you can be sure of that jed what are your thoughts on uh, tenor players sounds and developing your own sound uh well you know it's, you know all i can say is like the tenor players that i love uh are the you know the ones who have their unique and individual sound that you can hear in a few notes like dexter gordon you know who it is in a few notes uh hank mobley you know who it is in a few notes coltrane rollins uh stanley turntine you know uh joe henderson you know all these guys uh, if you're if you're uh, uh, a fan uh, or a student of jazz, 
you know, when you have an ear, you you recognize them instantly. And and I would say the same about Eric. You know, and Eric's sound is is so uh, you know beautiful and so his own, and uh, and all the inflections and nuances like when he plays a ballad or you know or even an up tempo uh you know tune it's 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 you know just so recognizable and and you hear in his sound all those you know you hear coltrane you hear uh you hear turntine you hear dexter you know uh and those are you know th that's you know but it's you know uniquely his sound and uh and style you know so that's what's that's what's so cool you know with eric Absolutely. Now, I wanted to talk let me about add one. I want yeah. to add one thing to that, Brad, because it's really important, actually, if we're talking about something, you know, super substantive regarding saxophone playing. The first thing that 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 all other musicians uh, seem to envy about the saxophone is that it has a vocal quality, or that if it, it's your a, a saxophonist is able to produce certain sounds that elicit emotional responses from the listener really to a greater degree, I think, than any of the other instruments. Now, I don't want to get in an argument about that, but let's say that the, of all the things that the saxophone has, that's the best. It's not the fact that you can play it fast, because nobody gives a shit, really. You can play the piano even faster, so let's just drop it. It's not about technique. It's about the, the, the sound that is produced and the emotional response that you're able to get from the audience and, therefore, the confidence you're able to project it with. Now... Jed was mentioning having a plethora of influences. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. And everybody did. And you know what I prefer is that my influences are absolutely transparent because the people that I adore, that's like a spice rack shelf. You know, you got the little chili peppers or the, the basil or whatever. We're not talking about MSG and bland bullshit and grand, white sugar influences. That's a waste of time. That you put some Stanley Turnkey, Benny Golson, Junior Cook, uh, and Coltrane, throw it in there, and then blow the horn the way you're going to blow it. I want everyone to hear what the influences are because I'm proud of them. Number one, and they're good influences. Absolutely. You know, Picasso once said, "I only steal from the best." So he said, "Great artists don't imitate; they steal." And what that means to me is. And I, I tell my students this all the time. So you, you hear Joe Henderson play a lick. You grab it. Now you can play it. What are you doing? Did you steal it or do, are you just imitating? Most of them are just imitating. Why? Because they heard the lick on Blue Bossa and they only play it when they play Blue Bossa. If they actually stole it, they would understand why he did what he did, how it relates to the root and the chord quality and how they could manipulate it. So, for instance, if I steal a lawnmower from my neighbor and want to turn it into a little... Uh, mini bike, like motor scooter bike, like we used to do when I was a kid. Well, then I've stolen, I've stolen it. I didn't borrow it. I stole it because I can do what I want with it. And that's the difference. You steal from the best, but once you have it in your possession, you can manipulate it. And that's where just where the tiniest twist, it's like you put these concepts in a Petri dish and you look at them and you say, oh, if I just flick that little bit over there and do it slightly different, people won't even recognize it. And they won't know that 99% of it is something that you stole. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about improvisation for a minute. Uh, you know, I am a, a filmmaker, and one of my mentors is Stanley Kubrick. And Kubrick once said that a film should be like a symphony. And when I think about listening to a solo sometimes in improvisation, it feels almost like a, a a movie to me. It feels like a story. Uh, now, you know, I've spoken to Sonny Rollins about this. I said, you know, when you improvise, man, you know, what goes through your head? He said, I don't think it's like meditation for me. It just kind of happens. Eric, when you improvise, are you conscious of the fact that you're telling a story? No, and not at all. And I'm, I'm going to just throw this out there. I don't disagree with, with you. I mean, I agree with you. And I want to pivot. Kubrick is right. A movie is a symphony. A symphony is not an improvisation. Um, I believe this is I-M-H-O in text speak. In my humble opinion, this idea, and it's taught in the conservatories, and it's, it's dispensed as if it's wise to young people. And I believe that it's not. 
when you're playing a, a solo, when you're improvising jazz, content is king, not the storytelling. So kids get into this uh, this uh, mindset. You know, how do you tell a story? You must start quietly and then build to a dramatic conclusion. Now that's boring as shit. You do that every time. Sometimes I want to start high and end low, or I might have ups and downs. But quite frankly, like Sonny said, I'm not thinking of it at all. I'm thinking of pellets of beautiful information. When you take Sonny Rollins solos, you can take any phrase he plays, and that is a lifetime of study in and of itself. And it does not necessarily relate to the next one. The harmonic rhythm of the tune, the tempo of the tune, and the feeling that's, that's all around swirling around in the air as you're playing contributes and changes second by second to how you are going to react. So it's really content. In my opinion, the key is to deliver a quality nugget, take a breath, deliver another quality nugget. It does not have to relate uh, in any way, shape or form to what you just played. But quite frankly, of course it will, because it's you that's playing. Something will, you know, there will be some common thread, but it's really the content. Each phrase should be a gem, like a gold nugget. That's what I, that's the way I would explain it. And I totally agree with Sonny. You are, he's not thinking shit. He's just firing. Yeah. And he's feeling. Uh, Jed, what's in your head when you're improvising? Mm, you know, just, uh, uh, it, it, I think, I think when to relax, you know, I think is probably, you know, the most, uh, and, 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 and this kind of, uh, relaxed concentration, you know, is when I play the best, you know, and, and, uh, and, and just trying to hear what I want to play, basically, you know, because, you know, I do play licks, you know, and, but, but hopefully they're not conscious. They're, they're, they're something that, you know, that I hear and then play, and that's, you know, when I'm playing the best. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's nothing, you know, like on the level of, uh, of Eric. You know, Eric plays so melodically and so, uh, uh, you know, uh, how he connects one idea to the next is really, uh, you know, uh, jaw dropping to me uh, uh, most of the time when I hear him, you know, it's like, wow, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, whether he's playing the blues or he's playing, uh, you know, uh, something uh, quite modern, it's, it's it, and it doesn't matter how complicated the tune is, Eric weaves, you know, his, his lines effortlessly and musically, you know, and, and that's, uh, and that's what I admire. And, you know, that's the only reason I'm here today is just to, you know, add to as, as a, as a fan, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, one other thing, if sometimes if it, if it sounds like we're telling a story, I would frame it in a different way. Well, I could, I could speak, Ex extemporaneously or impromptu and, and, and spin a yarn that would be coherent, I guess. The problem is when you're playing music, there are other people playing at the same time that you are. So that would be like in a cacophonous scenario where everyone is talking at the same time and I would have to concentrate to the degree where I could tell a coherent story in the middle of that. I don't know if it's possible. What you're really doing, if it sounds really connected, is, at least for me, I like to play topically. So let's say I'm, on the, I'm getting ready to come in with a solo. Let's say I'm the first solo or I'm following another soloist. Right before I start to play, if I'm able to, I, I try to be aware and have, it's either a thought or it's an impulse, like a muse. The muses are usually the best. The thing that just comes to you and you, you don't know where it came from, that's the topic for now. Maybe for the first chorus or maybe for the first half chorus, whatever it is. It could be a harmonic sequence, it could be a sound, it could be a shape of a line, it could be a, a dynamic. And when you kind of use that up, then you you either wait for it to come to you or think on it and you have another topic. So if I'm gonna play 10 choruses of Cherokee, a lot of times I will try to pick a topic for a chorus or two. All right, sometimes I don't pick it, sometimes it picks me. And those are better. It's very wise to uh, it's like Moses in the burning bush. Okay, he's 80 years old. Doesn't know what the hell he's doing. His uncle told him to, you know, lead the sheep around. All of a sudden, he, he sees a burning bush and he says, that sucks. But then he does a double take at it. And then the rest is history. 
when when things just appear in our in our sensory zone and and we do more than just walk through it when we just do a double take that's usually what you should go with probably in life too but especially with music those are the really beautiful things that kind of came from outside of your body absolutely uh, i got an interesting question here i want to get you guys to respond to this is from a viewer young list says how about toxicity and snobbery in jazz? In the UK, when I was growing up, I was always put off by the nasty superiority towards young people who want to learn. I learned anyway because I love the music. Guys, what are your thoughts on that? Eric? Well, uh, I think I understand what the what the viewer is is getting at and what the question is, or you know what what he's. Uh, relaying about his own experience and i would tend to agree with something and it happens in academia worst of all uh there's there's this impulse to mystify everything and to confuse people uh and that's really uh counter to the mission of being an educator or a teacher i mean what i try to do is to insist to the people that are studying with me that it's not as complicated as as you've been thinking it's actually simple and let, let let's do this if you want to get better at a certain thing let's demystify it let's figure a battle plan a way that you can and sonically to this chord progression or whatever it is that you're having trouble with and once we have a template for success we'll start with that and then find something else because it builds on itself it's so disingenuous for accomplished musicians to give false explanations of things with the intention of confusing people and oftentimes because they're quite frankly they are frightened that somebody might supersede them eventually that is just such horseshit the people that have that have influenced me the most the george coleman's harold mayburn's jimmy heath i mean these people they will go if you're if they see that a young person is listening and wants to know something they will just hand it to you on a silver platter it's right there they will tell you exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it because they're not concerned that that young person will be able to grab that information and supersede them how could they these people are too good just because you can understand it doesn't mean you can do it now that's another interesting thing about jazz it's not rocket science it's like uh, molecular biology or whatever uh, quantum physics you're looking at one plus one and two and zero it's it's almost that simple but to actually do it in real time as Jed said requires a lot of relaxation and focus and trust but these concepts that way of teaching that the listener was referring to really makes me angry I don't like that because this music nobody owns it and anything that's been sent out into the air is fair game for anybody that can either catch it or be helped to catch it and why shouldn't it be because it's all beautiful i mean it should be shared it shouldn't be hidden that really makes me mad jed what's your experience uh, learning from the masters and, and going up to people and talking to them like that you know my experiences have been you know, i mean like eric uh, you know i'll sit down with eric and he'll show me like one thing you know which which you know i'll wake up and and uh and use and 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 try and uh, uh, you know play it in different ways and different settings, you know. So I mean, you know, I I had uh, you know a few uh, uh, teachers and uh, like Greg Fishman and and uh, and Steve Solomon and you know they were all just so great. And I, I think the whole thing is you know the the music. Uh, you know, should be fun, you know, like playing music should be fun. You're getting together with other musicians, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it's just like the greatest uh, gift to be able to get out in, with, with your, with your friends, you know, who are, who, and play music, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's like a real honor, you know, then to perform. And, you know, when I've been around, uh, uh, I got a lesson with, you know, Sonny Stitt, you know, when I was young and I, uh, he was like so great and, and funny and uh, Houston person, you know, I got, I, I got a lesson with him, you know, when these guys would come to town, I'd go bug them, you know, and, and uh, they were always great. And you know, I never had, you know, one person who was not encouraging, you know, even at my, you know, my uh, level, you know. 
Yeah, you know, uh, things have changed so much uh, in my lifetime, certainly, because when, when I was a kid, there were these working bands like Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. Uh, let me get rid of this comment here. Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, Horace Silver, uh, Cannonball Adderley, and young musicians would come around, they'd get themselves together, they got a job, and they were schooled by the musicians and the groups that they played with. That was, that was the learning process. Unfortunately, now, the world has changed. Not that many working groups, not, not that many groups on the road for a long period of time. So the situation has changed. you got people learning in their houses through the Internet, or you have some jazz programs uh, that uh, a lot of them, uh, I don't want to make a blank, blank, blank statement about jazz education, but... Not all, not all the jazz courses taught in jazz programs around the world are taught by working musicians. I mean, when you got a guy like Eric uh, Alexander who's teaching, it's a different story because he learned from the masters that, he, that he's passing it on. So my question to you guys is, let's say you were a young musician and you want to learn how to play. You love this music. What's the best way to proceed? <laughs> I'd, I'd rather demonstrate. I don't even know if this horn works. I haven't played it in like a week because I am retired officially. But the best way to proceed, the, the, the young musicians should should know, and I will make sure they know that if they're not playing a tune, they're, then you're just a practice room player. I don't give a flying you know what. If I can walk by a practice room and hear <laughs> doesn't mean anything. So if the you know I would I would take a young musician and say hey. Do you even know your major scales? Let's start there. Well, if they know that, they'd say, well, let's insert a half step and we'll have what we call a seventh scale or a bebop scale. And so we'd learn that and I'd say, hey, look, uh, that tiny little bit of information, we can make it through Lover. And the kid will say, I don't know what Lover is. And I'll play the recording of Coltrane playing it with Lewis Hayes at AR-15 stun gun uh, hydrogen bomb tempo, which, by the way, Lou Hayes wants to play faster now, he told me. And so people better watch out. But if they only knew that scale. And all we did was play a seventh scale. We did nothing other than that. Uh, or another thing, for instance, now, and this is the beauty and, uh, of people like George Coleman and, and others that have helped me. He came to me one day and he said, yeah, boy, you know, autumn leaves. Get to the bridge. You know, you got that, uh, that A half diminished. Yeah, just, just play an F sharp triad. And I sat around thinking about that for eight years and couldn't figure it out. But then I finally did. So... <laughs> into a A dominant 7, 13, flat 9. And then slide that F sharp, try it down a half step. Now you got a D7 alter. So here we go. A one, two, three. Now that's badass. And that's just, that's one thought. Like the tiniest little thought. Uh, and, and you could take that, and if you steal it, well, every time I have a minor 2-5, I'll do that. So if I'm playing, what is this thing called, love, I shall do it, and I'll do it on Whisper Not and everywhere else. These ideas, they're not hard to understand or to even internalize. You must sit down and do what we call ass time. you got to sit on your ass and practice them so that they become available to you at a moment's notice. You know, you can think about what you want to do all you want, before it's time to do it. And if you can't get to it, that's another thing George said. There's a lot going on here. You got to think about what you want to play, but then you got to fire these neurotransmitters out of your head into your fingers. And then you got to be able to uh, actually move them with the correct fingerings in the variety of keys you're in. There's a lot of work 
<laughs> that goes into it. You know, it's like playing tennis or something. I mean, you got to put a lot of practice in so that you're able to access the, the information that you care about. Yeah, well, uh, two of my favorite improvisers, and I've been very lucky to know both of them, are Michael Brecker and Sonny Rollins. The oh, my God. <laughs> the similarity it is, they practiced a lot. And, you know, obviously that, that uh, came through. Now, Eric, I got a and question. It shows. It's and it. it shows, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it does show. It's like, how is anybody going to make – it's like Miles Davis got so mad when people would come up to him and say – Wow, what a gift you have. You're such a natural. He'd say, motherfucker, I'm practicing a trumpet 30, you know, 30 hours a day to play like this. Get out of my face. I mean, what is that? That's almost an insult. Like, oh, you're a natural, and we could take that further. You know, that could be a racial insult. It's just nasty. You cannot play this music unless you put in your time. You just can't. It's Absolutely. not possible. Absolutely. Got a question here from Sean Murray, Eric. Who are some non-tenor horn players that have influenced you? Uh, horn or anything? Well, no, non-horn. Oh, non-horn. Yeah. No, but I thought he said non. Oh, non-tenor horn. Okay. Well, every single great player in the history of jazz that doesn't play tenor, um, in particular, who have I learned like a lot of? Who did I uh, extract a lot of material from? Let me see. Uh, well, Freddie Hubbard for sure. Pianists. A ton, you know, McCoy Tyner in particular, Tommy Flanagan, Sonny Clark, Sonny Clark, a lot, a lot, lot, lot. I could play Sonny Clark for you on the piano. Let me see, McCoy, Tommy Flanagan, Sonny Clark. Uh, hmm. That's Eric, about it. Well, let me ask you. Well, Clifford me, Brown. Clifford Brown. Let me ask you this. These days, who do you listen to? What do you mean by that? When you put on a CD or you listen, you know, you listen to a, a, a file or something, what are you listening to today? Well, I, t I tend to listen, if you're talking about jazz, I tend to listen to the stuff I've always listened to. When people send me things, you know, sometimes Adam Nussbaum will send me, you know, he's got all these rare, crazy things. I'll put on what he sends me. Uh, I find myself listening a lot more these days to pop, <laughs> believe it or not, pop music and classical music. Uh, because the jazz, the stuff that has appealed to me uh, in the jazz genre, it's just spiraling in my brain 24-7. It can't be shut off. And I put on these recordings, and I already know uh, what's the next phrase. I mean, I've listened to them so much. Uh, if you're asking me, uh, would, and this is a typical question, what players of your generation do you listen to frequently? The answer is none. And uh, I'll just say it honestly, I don't. I don't put on anybody in my generation or younger generation on a regular basis on the saxophone. If somebody shows me something that, and I am free to say this now because I've retired. I, if somebody shows me something that I will uh, be knocked out by and really want to pursue and listen with great intent, I will listen to it. If I hear it and I like it, I will listen to it. But as of yet, no. And that includes myself. I don't sit around listening to myself either. If I'm going to listen to a saxophonist, you can be sure it'll be Stanley Turrentine, or, or whatever. Oh, it, and also, I tend to listen a lot to vocalists. I mean, lately I've been listening to Tony Bennett, the movie album with Maybe September and Shadow of Your Smile, things like that. I like to listen to orchestrated music. I'm concentrating on the harmony and learning lyrics. And Jed, what are you listening to these days? Uh, you know, pretty much the same. Uh, you know, I go, I go on when I hear of a new player and I go on YouTube and I listen to them and you know, and uh, if there's something that uh, moves me, you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, download it off of iTunes or, or you know, or, or market my YouTube, uh, uh, you know, uh, favorites. But, uh, you know, most of the time uh, when I put on music, I listen to stuff that, uh, you know, the same players, you know, uh, Train, uh, Stanley Turrentine, Hank Mobley, uh, Sonny Rollins, you know, uh, Whoop, what happened? Don't know, but I'll chime in there. You know, sometimes uh, uh, out of the blue, something will, will pop on the radio, and I and I will, as Eddie Henderson likes to say, pull over the car and finish listening to it because it's so good. And oftentimes I know who it is, but I don't, I'm not familiar with the recording. So the other day I was 
in the car and I heard something by Mike Derubo. And I knew it was him. She and I'm talking about that. Now, that's a person that you can recognize in, instant. Well, I can within two two measures. And I don't know. Uh, I know. But I heard like two bars he was playing about. I don't even recall what it was. And it was just so great. So I pulled over and listened to it. Another thing was, um, God, I was so taken by this. And we did something for Birdland recently, Donnie McCaslin and myself. I heard something that he did some years ago. It was a strange recording. It was kind of an art recording. He wasn't really playing in time. He was just playing the saxophone, but he was doing it so well. So I really had to pull over and listen to that. Another one was, uh, you know, Branford did that solo recording. Branford Marsalis. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't even remember what the name of the recording is, but it, it came on and I just really had to stop and listen to it because it was so good. Uh, you know, and, and that's what I mean. Every now and then, or sometimes I'll, oh, I heard some shit that Seamus Blake played with the with the Mingus big band. Oh, Christ, it was so good. And I called him. I had to say, look, man, here we go. I'm not worthy. It was, it was, I love that when I hear something that just makes me stop in my tracks and, and I'm thinking, it is so good. What the hell is it? I don't even know what they're doing, but it is awesome. That's what I'm looking for. So when these things pop up, yeah, I'll listen to them. But by and large, like, you know, it's it's, it's rarer now. And maybe I'm just an old man. I am an old man. I should be dead. So I'm a dinosaur. But uh, I like what I like. Okay, we're coming to the end of the show here. I want to get one final question. And uh, this is from John Bauer. He says, sex players seem to be way, t- way too preoccupied with gear. How do you get students off worrying about reeds and mouthpieces and focusing on the music? Well, it's real easy. If you play a tenor saxophone, find yourself a metal auto link and a, maybe a three or a three and a half reed and figure out how to play it. Now get your ass off the gear. That's about it. I could take that mouthpiece and put it on a, on a Vito or a Bundy or a, anything. And I will sound exactly the same as I sound. The problem is, equipment that uh, promises a lot of this at the expense of a lot of that, you know, super this or super that, it, it's no good. You gotta, you wanna create the sound with your concept, first and foremost, as Harold Mayburn was fond of saying, it's your concept is everything. And then you use your physicality to produce it. So I don't even tell people how to blow, how to hold the horn, how to move their fingers. If they achieve the sound, that they're going for, I say, as long as that doesn't hurt physically, that's what you should do. Yeah. Well, we're, we're kind of at the end of the show here. I'm going to play some music to go out. Uh, any closing thoughts from either of you? I have to teach a saxophone student online now, so I'm going to eject. But, <laughs> but uh, I'm really happy you had me on. I like talking about music. It still is the most important thing in my life, even though it's not really in my life anymore, but it's the way it goes these days. We can get through it. We will. Jed from Mexico, any final thoughts? Viva la Mexico. Jed, Jed can't hear anything. Mexico, right. Jed. Right. <laughs> I think he fell asleep. Who knows? Uh, listen, uh, thanks so much to Eric and to Jed for participating. I had a lot of fun today. I usually do one-on-one. Perhaps we'll do more of these. Uh, uh, I thought it was Amy Van Dorn. I, you got me confused. That's my high school girlfriend. <laughs> you got a lot of ex-girlfriends, Eric. Uh, no, I don't. So uh, next, so next week, uh, our special guest will be a wonderful vocalist, Roberta Gambarini. Going to go out here with some Eric. Uh, oh, Brett, uh, Brett. When yeah. You, when, you have, when you have Roberta, I adore her. She's so great. And we used to talk about doing something. I've, I've begged her. I want to play obligados behind her and let her sing. And we never got around to it. Can you please mention to her that Eric is dying to do that at some point soon? A project. I will. I will definitely pass it on. So everybody... and Harold Mayburn. Harold Mayburn loved her. She wanted to sing Lush Life in another key, and she showed up at a, a ceremony in Sopac. There was not one other piano player in there, and there were about fifty that would dare touch Lush Life in another key. And Harold Mayburn did it. You ask her about that. He kicked ass.